Pokemon Renegade Platinum, a modified version of Pokemon Platinum made by the legend Rayano, who is known for making a variety of fantastic Pokemon enhancement hacks. This game features all Pokemon from the first four generations, gym leaders with full teams of six, and more competitive movesets, quality of life features like an Eevee trainer, the fairy type, Pokemon type changes and stat buffs, and much more. As somebody who loved Vanilla Platinum, I was super excited to play this game. However, I wasn't going to do any old normal playthrough. I intended to beat this game using Hardcore Nuzlocke rules. Pause now for the full rules of a Hardcore Nuzlocke. But, in order to make this challenge more interesting, I decided to add a few additional rules to these five. I play with Dupes Claws, which means I cannot catch another mod of the same evolutionary line that I already have. I ban all setup moves like Sword Dance, Agility, and so forth. I ban all forms of weather in both abilities and moves. I ban the move Substitute. I remove EV yields from the game. I ban the use of all legendary and mythical Pokemon. And most importantly, if a single Pokemon dies, I have to restart the game. What is up with it? I'm Dehong, and this is the story of how I beat a Renegade Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke Deathless. One of the first things you do in any Pokemon game is pick a starter. For this game, I choose Chimchar as my starter, because you battle not only Barry, but also Lucas or Dawn depending on which one you play as, so not having to face Infernape is very nice. This also matters for another reason much later on, so I will get to that when we get there. Additionally, you can get the other two starters in Professor Rowan's lab later anyway. I chose Turtwig over Piplup, as its evolutionary one has access to Shell Armor, one of the best abilities in the game. Later, I would take the Eevee your mom has and make my way to the first gym while picking up some encounters. In Jubilife City, you are given the Kanto starters. For this run, I chose Charmander, as Charizard in this game is a fire dragon type with Levitate. Bulbasaur is also solid, because Venusaur gets stick fat in this game. And Squirtle is never an option, because Blastoise has Drizzle, and I ban the use of weather abilities. After an easy berry fight, we make our way to Orbrick City, the location of the first gym. There I meet Steven, who gives me a Beldum, and I take the Mudkip from the Hoenn starters in the PC. Okay, okay, I know what you guys are thinking. You can't take both the Hoenn starter and the Beldum, they have the same met location. Well, as it turns out, the Nuzlocke rule says that you can only catch the first Pokemon you meet, and gift Pokemon aren't caught, they're given to you. Also, Generation 3 is my favorite, so if I get a chance to use more Pokemon from that generation, I'll absolutely take it and thus I decided to make an exception here and invoke the gift clause just this one time. Feel free to call my run invalid though, and I'm down to talk semantics in the comments below, but I had fun with this rule and ultimately, that's what matters the most to me. Anyway, I head into my first gym battle against Rourke, who, despite having a full team of 6 in this game, is still pretty easy. In general, you can take care of him with any water, grass, or fighting type that you obtain, and you should have a guarantee of at least a couple of those. Combined with the fact that you already can get the Water Pulse and Brick Break TMs in this split, taking care of Rook's team should be no problem. In my case, I led with Taunt Unferno to prevent Stealth Rock and Thunder Wave on the Nose Pass and let Marsh Top and Shell Armor Turtwig do the rest of the work. Before we keep going, I want to talk about one of my encounters which made this run a little spicy. In Orbit Gate, I normally hope for a Geodude or a Zubat, which I have a 50% chance of getting one of them in a vacuum. But anything that's not Wizmer is generally fine for me. This time, however, I got a Trap Inch, and here are Flygon's stats in this game. That's right, it's pretty much a pseudo legendary, making it way better than it is in vanilla games. Thanks, Drayano, for making Flygon everything I dreamed it should have been. Love what you did with it. You know what else I love? When people subscribe to my channel. If you enjoy Nuzlocke content, please consider subscribing as it helps my channel grow, and I will continue to bring more videos about my Nuzlocke runs. Thank you very much. Now back to the video. The Trapinch encounter made things a little weird though, because the importance of getting a Geodude or a Zubat, or even an Onyx or Aeron here is twofold. One, they are all duplicates in the future, which helps with encounter routing. This leads to reason two. With a Geodude or Zubat, the other one becomes a guaranteed encounter in Ravaged Path thanks to something known as Repel Manipulations. For those who don't know, Repels will prevent a Pokemon at a lower level than the one in your party lead from showing up, which means that you can lead with a specific Pokemon level in order to force a specific encounter. For example, if on a certain route with only Rattata and Rayquaza, a Rattata appears at levels 8 to 9, 
but the Rayquaza appears at levels 9 to 10, then by leading a Pokemon at level 10 and using Repels, you will guarantee a Rayquaza encounter. I use this a lot to my advantage while playing this game, getting ideal Pokemon such as Guaranteed Gligar on Route 206, Sneasel on Route 216, Chansey on Route 209 due to having a Starly dupe, as well as some 50-50s like Rowlet or Poochiana on Route 202, Rolls or Bellsprout on 204, and Zubat or Geodude in Ravaged Path like mentioned before. Now how does this relate to encounter routing, you may ask? I'll talk about this once we get to the wake split, so hold that thought. Moving on to Gardenia split, I had my first encounter with Team Galactic, and afterwards picked up an Intimidate Totodile, Bolt Absorb Chinchou, and a Voltorb in Foroma Town Route 205 and Valley Windworks respectively. I wish I got a different electric type like Elecate or Magnemite, but oh well, can't win them all. And yes, Totodile's evolutionary line does get Intimidate in this game. In addition to arguably the best ability, Feraligator also gets a small attack buff as well as an additional dark typing. We deal with Mars pretty handily. This time, she has a Bronzor and a Yanma in addition to her Zubat and Perugly, but it's still not hard. Also, in this game, you battle the stat trainers when you meet them too, which means we had a Cheryl fight to deal with in Eterna Force. She's not too hard at all either, and generally, you should have the right tools to deal with each of her four Pokemon, which are Drifloon, Makahita, Whalmer, and Chansey. After helping Cheryl out, I got a Mistreepus in Eterna Forest whose line is now Ghost Fairy. In this game, you have to travel to Route 216 to find Gardenia, where, if you remember, can get a guaranteed Sneasel using Repel manipulations. Additionally, on the way there, I got one of the most important encounters in the game, Phoebus and Mount Coronet. My Lodic didn't receive any stat buffs in this game, but it now sports an additional fairy type like Mistreebus, and Water Fairy is one of the best type combinations possible. Now for the Gardenia fight. Her team is as follows, with a notable step up in difficulty compared to Vanilla. Additionally, her Rosary now sports really good coverage on its moveset, and the Technician ability will make the Magical Leaf hit even harder. This is where my first attempt lost by the way, because I had a major brain fart moment as seen here. Okay, Lock Punch, I don't think I'm in range, am I? Oh, I am in range. Alright. But whatever, gotta not be an idiot sometimes. Generally, my strategy is to start with one of the fire type starters I can get between either Charmeleon or Kulava. This is the reason why I recommend that you take at least one of those two if you're not allowing all gifts. This allows you to bait in the Tangle after the Blossom goes down, which should die pretty easily. When Grottle is in, I like to do some pipping with Intimidate and eventually kill with Crobat, who baits in Roserade. Roserade goes down by having the tank come in safely and chip it down, then I secure the kill with Crobat. Berloom comes in and I farm that with the bat, and finally I beat the Cherim with Fake Out to break the Sash and Flame Wheel from the Monferno, earning me my second gym badge. Going into the Fantina split, the first thing I do is catch the Rotom in the old Chateau, then battle Jupiter in the Eternal Galactic Building. Like Mars, she has a party of four instead of two, adding Sableye and Tangela while also evolving her Zubat. After this, we pick up the Togepi Egg from Cynthia, which is important as Togekiss is one of the best Pokemon in the game. Heading south, I go to the Orberg Mining Museum to turn my Armored Fossil into a Shieldon. You can get all the fossils in this game, but I went with the Shield Pokemon because Bastiodon has insane defensive stats and a Steel Typing, making it great for pivoting and walling. Wayward Cave has a guaranteed Gabite encounter which on paper sounds amazing. It is, until you get a cruddy nature with it. And that kept happening to me in my past attempts, until finally... Come on, please. Yes, it worked! Woo! About damn time I got a good nature Gabite. After three really bad natures, I finally get one that actually wor works out. Oh my goodness. In order to proceed east, you actually have to battle Mira in Wayward Cave and help her get out. The battle itself is pretty simple with the right Pokemon to handle her special attackers. I recommend a Steel-type and an Umbreon at least for her. And before you cross Mount Coronet, you also have a battle with Lucas or Dawn, depending on who you choose to play as. For those who don't know, these two have slightly different teams. Lucas has a Granbull and a Licky Licky, while Dawn has a Clefable and a Lopunny. Here is what Lopunny looks like in this game. 
Yeah, as you can see, it has a much better attack stat and an additional fighting type, like its Mega Evolution. This is why it's common for players to choose to play as a girl, as Lucas's team is much easier to deal with. In fact, this is where another one of my runs ended due to me carelessly planning and getting para hacks by her Clefable. But as long as you plan carefully and patiently, you should not have any issues. After this is one of the most challenging fights in the game if you're not ready for it, against Aaron the Elite 4 member, right before Heart Home City. What I like to do here is leave Monferno with Stealth Rock and a Petra Berry, then KO Dustox, Beautify, and Venomoth with Crobat. Use Shell Armor Torterra for the Drapion, and a Fire type for his Scizor. Fantina is an interesting battle, and I found this one strategy for her thanks to DRXS. This is her team in this game, having a nice balance of both offense and defense. As such, the strategy you are about to see will be using a mixed bag of aggression and passiveness. Basically, you lead with a male Pokemon with Captivate, usually Umbreon, because the Drifwim will still baton pass after special attack debuffs, and usually it passes to Miss Magius. Bastion is a solid check to Miss Magius, which is another reason why I chose Shield On for my fossil. Unfortunately for me though, I did have to steer a bit because Miss Magius landed a crit into a special defense drop on my Bastiodon. That's a 1 out of 80 chance to happen by the way. And after some messiness, it was actually Torterra that ended up taking the Miss Magius out. After that, Umbreon or Bastiodon can take down the Dripwim itself, although I ended up defeating the Dripwim with my Torterra due to the aforementioned steering. Togekiss beats the Spiritomb, and a normal type with Breast Talk will counter the Dust Hops because it has no moves that can hit a normal type. Any of these aforementioned Pokemon can be used for a Bayonet. So pretty much the only variant is your Gengar answer, which in my opinion by default should be Technician's Sneasel. Unfortunately, mine was inner focused and a bold nature, so I was not using it much this run. My original plan was to use a combination of Corterra and Umbreon, but my Bastiodon getting crit and a special defense drop caused things to go off the rails. So I had to improvise from there, due to both Bastiodon and Torterra not being healthy enough anymore. Things going wrong is actually how I lost my 4th attempt, because I had to risk a crit after some earlier bad RNG. I, I think I want to crunch, however I do risk like half the crit rolls and flinch. Okay, whatever, please, good luck. Unbelievable, dude. <sighs> Are you kidding me? And if I had dodged that crit, I would have just won the battle. So it was very unfortunate that it had to end that way. This time though, I was able to adapt properly, and you can find the full battle under my Twitch highlights. Speaking of which, I stream all my Nuzlocke runs on my Twitch channel. If you enjoy the content so far, be sure to give me a follow on Twitch so you can watch me do my Nuzlocke challenges live. Mayling Split doesn't really have any notable battles besides your first battle against Barry since you had zero badges. Now he has a Heracross and evolved the rest of his team. There's also the tag battle with Barry against Saturn and Backlot. My strategy is to take down Backlot's side first because Saturn's Bronzong is not really an offensive threat. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to focus in on one side in a double battle. That way, you only need to worry about one opposing mod instead of two. Just be careful when Barry sent out his Snorlax, as it does virtually nothing. Kind of like the Spear Pillar attack battle, where his Munchlax in the vanilla games is also very useless. Funny story though, I did actually almost lose to these twins over here on Route 209, and well, let's just see how that happened. Charmer. Oh god. Oh my god, he hold he held on. I'm I should have lost there. Fast forward to Veilstone City, and the Mailing battle is, in my opinion, one of the more interesting gym battles in the game, and I had a lot of fun planning for it. Her team is as follows. As you can see, it features a nice variety of fighting type Pokemon, and their movesets have really good coverage as well. I lead with Miss Magius against her Medicham, which sports the following moveset. So my strategy is to pivot between Miss Magius and Umbreon, because the Medicham will quick Zen Headbutt against Miss Magius, 
while against Umbreon, it will use High Jump Kick. By switching between these two Pokemon, I will avoid taking any damage at all while the Medicham eventually kills itself with High Jump Kick recoil damage. With Miss Magius in, after the Medi goes down, Lucario switches in. This baits out a Flash Cannon, so I can get an easy switch to Infernape, which kills with the Fake Out into close combat. The Fake Out is necessary in order to break the Focus Sash that the Lucario holds. You may have noticed that I put a White Herb on my Infernape as well, and here's why. The way that the AI and Pokemon works is that if it sees a kill with a move, it will always choose to use that move. However, if more than one move can kill, then it will randomly select among the possible killing options. After a debuff from the close combat, the Glade that comes in can see a kill with either Zen Headbutt or Drain Punch, and that means that Umbreon would no longer be a safe switch. Ergo, the White Herb guarantees the leg to use Zen Headbutt on my Infernape. After this, I showed why Encore is such a powerful move by locking Gallade into Reflect and eventually killing it with Togekiss, and I cleaned up the rest of Meilin's team using a combination of Viscor and Togekiss. With that, I have now conquered half the gyms of Sinnoh. Now we are on Wake Split. I'm sure some of you remember when I talked about encounter routing and repel manipulations. Before I go into how these two concepts are related, let me explain what encounter routing is. Picture this. Suppose on Route A you have a 50-50 chance between a Bidoof and a Caterpie, while on Route B you have a 90% chance for a Caterpie and a 10% chance for a Giratina. What you would want to do here is get a Pokemon on Route A first, because if you get a Caterpie, you will have a 100% chance to obtain a Giratina on Route B by the Dupes Clause. Even better is if you already have a Bidoof, and that way you are guaranteed the Giratina for sure. Essentially, encounter routing is when you order what locations to get an encounter to increase your odds of getting a certain Pokemon. Anyway, back to what I was talking about during the Rourke split. Because I didn't have both Zubat and Geodude from then, I had to hope for a Zubat in the Ravaged Path, which I did end up getting luckily. This is because Grabbler is a guaranteed encounter on Route 214, while Dugtrio is a guaranteed encounter in the Maniac Tunnel using Repel Manipulations. Here are the encounters for Orberg Gate. By delaying Orberg Gate until the Wake Split, getting Grabbler and Dugtrail as well as Zubat would allow me to get a guaranteed real loot, which in my opinion is very important in the mid late game. I'll get to exactly why when we reach that part. If I got the Geodude in the Orberg Mine instead, then I wouldn't have had to use my Route 214 encounter on Grabbler, and instead I could have tried for, let's say, the Honey Tree, which could potentially get me a nice normal type. After getting the three aforementioned Pokemon, I also pick up two more important encounters for the Wake Battle, the Lapras Gift in Pastoria City, and a Lombre on Route 212. Before going to Wake's gym, we have one more battle with Barry. This time, he has a full team, adding two of Arcanine, Brave Loom, or Azumarill to his squad, depending on which starter you took at the beginning. I got the first two because I chose Chimchar as my starter. This battle shouldn't be too hard, and all future berry fights are pretty similar from this point on, as this team doesn't undergo any major changes or additions. After that, it was time to take on the Pastoria City Gym. In this game, there is permanent rain inside, like how the Lawbridge and Sutopolis Gyms in Emerald Kaizo have permanent sun and rain, respectively. Because I was playing without the use of weather, I could not simply teach a Pokemon Sunny Day, for example, to get rid of the rain, so I had to dig deeper for our game plan. His team is as follows. While on paper, it might not seem like too strong of a team, we have to keep in mind that this is permanent rain and these Pokemon also get stabbed water moves, as well as improved movesets, so this battle isn't actually that easy. In fact, I think that this is actually the second hardest gym fight in the game using my rule set, and the hardest up to this point in the game. Ultimately, I decided to implement the PP stall strategy. This means I would keep pivoting between Pokemon in order to force the opposing Mon to use up all its PP. As you can see here, I am switching between my Water Absorb Lapras and my Levitate Rotom to wear Wake's Quagsire out of Aqua Tail and Earthquake PP. And then my pre burn Marvel Skill, Milotic, uses Recover to exhaust the Ice Punch PP. Now, the only remaining move left for Quagsire is Recover. This gives me an opportunity to set up Stealth Rocks and Parish Song in order to force the AI to switch to Gyarados as I switch to the Rotom from my Ludicolo, as demonstrated here. But it shouldn't matter, I don't think I'm going to be using this to attack more than like 3 times. Okay, so now, 
His Parish Con counts to one, so it's gonna switch. I'm reading the switch over to Gyarados. Easy. Gyarados? Gyarados? Excellent. It's so weird that the AI will switch on, like, Parish Song, but it won't switch when, when it's Choice Locked into something. Or Encored into something. You may be wondering how I knew that Gyarados was going to switch in in that scenario. Well, I'll tell you how when we get to the explanation of how Switch and AI works this generation. So stay put. Anyway, from here, Rotom beats the Gyarados despite the Wakonberry thanks to the Stealth Rock's assist. Lucy beats Ludicolo, Milota counters the Poliwrath, and Ludicolo claims a Plaxar, Sharpedo, and Floatzel thanks to the Swift Swim ability. Funny story by the way, I actually forgot to heal my PP, so Ludicolo almost didn't have enough Giga Drains to win. But, oh well. Never punished. After the wake battle, we chase down a galactic grunt and Cynthia gives us a secret potion to help out the poor Psyduck on Route 210, thus allowing us to make our way to Celestic Town. There is one thing you must be warned about, however. You see this duo walking in a circle? Yeah, you best avoid them at all costs. These two are considered the hardest optional in the game, and if you run into them, you will most likely lose a mon or even wipe in a non one death equals reset. In fact, that's exactly how my second attempt ended. Oh my god, no. Oh god. This is my this might be where we wipe. <sighs> oh no, this is so bad. Oh uh, no! I can't let you in on that, so. Okay. Well, that was good. Falk will tell me. Hey, okay, nice. His okay, thing. And I'm frozen. Great. Take out. Flinch? Sag. All right, that's a. Oh wait, did I live that? I just have to switch Merc, Hanshka, and Hope. All right, good luck. Okay, that works. Crap, static. Okay, we're still in this question mark. Okay, that works. Oh my God, you got static too. Okay, no, you're dead, fudge. Yeah, that's a real bummer, boys. <sighs> Luckily, this time around, I was able to avoid this demon ace duo, and I could keep my run going. Right before Celestic Town, you have a battle against Lucas or Dawn, and this time they have a full team. The party is fully evolved, with the new additions being the Kanto Evolution, strong against your starter choice, and an Alakazam. The battle itself shouldn't be too difficult, but I did learn about a quirk in the AI after I almost lost my run to it, as you can see right here. This is Mammoth Swine, yep. He wants an Earthquake here. We switched to Crobat first, but we can't get hit by Earthquake from the Crobat. No! Why? Why would you do that? Okay, never punished though. That was... Why would you do that? Why would you avalanche me? But, never punished, I guess? Allow me to explain why that happened. For some reason, the AI in Generation 4 likes to quick moves that double damage if the target is hit first. These moves would include things like Revenge, Payback, and Avalanche. I don't really know entirely how it works, but it can happen sometimes. Sort of like Solar Beam AI, where the AI will click Solar Beam sometimes in the sun, even if it isn't the highest damaging move. Moving on, in Celestic Town we have the first Cyrus battle of the game, which is honestly very easy. It's just like the first battle in Vanilla, but everything is fully evolved and he added a Magnezone. But what is in this game that is not in Vanilla Platinum, however, is a battle with Darok, 
the frontier reign of the Sinnoh Battle Frontiers Battle Castle. This battle takes place at the Pal Park. Here is his team, which looks like it can be pretty tough on paper, but there's a huge saving grace to this battle. His team basically only has attacking moves, therefore making each turn very predictable, and as long as you pivot correctly, you shouldn't have any problems. I lead with Specsmith's Magius to take out the Gulade with the Moonblast. Empoleon comes in next, and Lantern walls it out and KOs. This battle is the first major one in the game to showcase why Bastion is such a good Pokemon. It allows me to pivot to Miss Magius, then Umbreon to take out the Alakazam with the Black Glasses boosted Sucker Punch, as well as PP stall the Staraptor out of close combats. Finally, the Metagross and Entei go down to Charizard and Swampert, respectively. When you reach Candlelight City, you have another berry battle, and then there's the one with Riley at Iron Island. His team has a bunch of strong physical attackers that can do some real damage if you're not ready for it. But then I realized that Adaptability Lucario is capable of defeating a wide majority of his team, so that's exactly what I used. Remember, this Lucario is potentially guaranteed if you do the right repel manips and encounter routing. Then you take a quest through Iron Island, and then you can finally challenge Byron at the Candlelight City Gym. I'm not kidding when I say this by the way, but Byron is actually the easiest gym leader in the game. His team gets swept by Infernape, no joke. Just set up rocks, make sure that dual screens aren't up when you KO the Bronzong, and you're good to go. My Infernape was Jolly 8 Special Attack IVs, and even that was enough to KO Steelix and Fortress with an Expert Belt boosted Flamethrower, which close combat would not have. This is one of the many reasons why choosing Infernape is so good. And if you don't have the Fire Monkey, then, well, you probably have to do some more planning for this fight. First thing I do after completing this split is meet up with Professor Rowan, Barry, and Dawn, which prompts me to confront Saturn at Lake Valor after he set up a bomb or something like that. This time he has 5 Pokemon instead of 3 like Vanilla, adding an Alkazam and a Rhydon. These nuts! <laughs> and the battle is rather straightforward, in my opinion. The only thing you need to be careful of is his Bronzong because it has Explosion, but if you manage to bait it out last, it should never explode, to my knowledge. Otherwise, use a Ghost-type, something with Damp, or a Chillin' Berry. Following my conquering of Saturn, I had to go save Dawn in Lake Verity and battle Mars, who also has a team of 5 this time around, and a Bronzong with Explosion as well. But I couldn't find a way to bait that thing out last, so I had to rely on Damp Polyrock. With this done, I finally make my trek up north to Snowpoint City. Upon arriving in Snowpoint City, there are these two folks standing right outside the Snowpoint Temple who want to battle. The trainer on the left uses the three Pokemon on the top, while the trainer on the right uses the ones on the bottom. And because this is a battle against two trainers, remember, if you take out one side first, then it becomes a 2v1. I use this strategy that I developed from my VGC experience here. They lead with Blissey and Heracross, while I led with Togekiss and Lucario. By doing this, Heracross would always see a kill with close combat on Lucario, which then I can use Togekiss to redirect using Follow Me. Because Togekiss 4x resists the fighting type close combat, I didn't take much damage from it. By this, I'm able to take out the Blissey, Meganium, and Fur Alligator with just Lucario, and by this point the Heracross was minus 3 on its defenses, so basically any super effective move would kill it. The rest of this fight is history as not even the Typhlosion and the Tyranitar could hold up in a 2v1. Do you remember when I said that I thought that Wake was the second hardest gym fight in this game? The title of the hardest gym leader in the game goes to Candice, because without weather, she becomes somewhat box dependent. This is her team, and as you could probably infer, this battle has permanent hail thanks to Abomasnow's Snow Warning. On top of that, a couple of her Pokemon have abilities that take advantage of the hail, and some of them also know Blizzard, which does not miss in this weather. If you guessed that I would take a similar approach to this fight as I did with Crusher Wake, you are correct. After Infernape easily one hit KOs the Obama Snow, I did a PP stall strategy against her wall rain and had to find a way to get a burn on it, whether it would be Scald or Rotom's Will Wisp. The reason for this is because of the peculiar way that Gen 4 Switch in AI works. It first checks to see if there are super effective moves left on its team and if it does, it will pick the mod with the best offensive typing. In this case, however, none of her remaining Pokemon had a fighting type move, which is Blissey's only weakness. This means that it moves on to the super quirky phase 2. The way that this part works is that the AI calculates how much damage each move on the rest of the team does when used by the Pokemon that just fainted, and picks the party member with the move that does the most damage. 
In other words, it's as if the just painted Pokemon called its remaining teammates' moves from assist. This also means that stab is considered for discalculation. But there is a catch to this. The AI actually takes the damage module 255. So suppose that a move's max roll does 300, then it actually calculates it as 45. In both of these situations, by the way, the tiebreaker would be the party order, meaning that the AI will pick whichever Pokemon is closer to the lead in terms of position. Also, for those of you who still remember, this is how I was able to predict the Gyarados switch in against Wake. But continuing on, as you can see in the damage calculator here, the max roll from Walrein using Weavile's Icicle Crash is 256, which the AI counts as 1, whereas Walrein using Bamosong's Earthquake is 201. Therefore, the burn was necessary to cut these damage calculations in half and get Candice to switch in her Weavile instead of her Mamoswine. I wasn't sure if the AI considered status conditions or stat buffs and nerfs, but luckily, I was correct. This was important so I could switch in Fernape on a Crunch or Icicle Crash in order to get the KO there. If Mamoswine came in first, then her Weavile would have come in last and against my Weavile, that scenario had a lose condition. Hers could have used Aerial Ace on my Infernape switch in, which would end my run if I got hit by a crit. Moving along, after Infernape takes out Weavile, Mamoswine comes in, which takes a pivot to Rotom then Lucario to KO, because Lucario one-shots with Aura Spear. Next up is the Demon Glaceon. Her Glaceon has super good coverage and buff stats in this game. To make matters worse, it has Snow Cloak as I've shown before, along with holding a Bright Powder and Double Team, making this thing insanely hard to hit reliably. This is exactly why I delayed my Aura Brigade encounter for the real loot, as Aura Spear Adaptability Lucario is by far the most reliable way to beat this thing. After I take out this Glaceon, I use my female bold non-technician Weavile to beat the Ace Frostlass, earning myself the Icicle Badge. Now we are on my favorite part of the game, the Team Galactic Finale. Much like Vanilla, you have to go through the Team Galactic headquarters in Veilstone City and battle some Grunts, Cyrus, and Saturn. Cyrus is still pretty easy as it's essentially the same team as your first battle with him in Celestic Town, plus a Gyarados, so you can do what you did back then and then bring an Electro-type for his new team member. After this is also the Saturn battle to free the Lake Trio from Team Galactic's control. He uses the same 5 Pokemon from the Lake Bower battle, plus a Magmortar and his Rhydon has evolved into a Rhyperior. This time, his team uses stronger items for offense, and his Bronzong has a dual screen set and no explosion. Thus, this battle is also not too hard, as long as you get rid of Bronzong without the screens up and pivot correctly. I make my way up to Spear Pillar, and there, I face arguably the hardest battle before the Elite Four, the tag battle of me and Barry versus Mars and Jupiter. In vanilla, you probably remember this fight as being pretty trivial. However, in this game, the two commanders now have full parties of six, making this a 12v12 battle. If you remember at the beginning, I said that Barry's Empoleon helps a lot in the later part of the game, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. Picking Chimchar means that Barry will actually be of use for this battle, which is crucial for a fight where there's already a good amount of variance. I don't think a post commentary will be able to summarize this battle well, so I'd rather have you watch the footage with my live commentary and decision making. Okay. These guys both lead with their Crobats. And Barry leaves the Star Raptor, and I leave Magnazone. I want to get rid of Mars's Crobat first, so I'm just gonna uh, Thunderbolt it. Okay, Brave Bird. Does Barry target Mars's? Okay, he does. Um. All right. Well, if Jupiter's Crobat does go down, that's like not that bad. Okay, this is this Crobat's gonna go down. After this, I think it should bait in. Gastrodon and Electivire. Now the thing is, um, Staraptor is at very low HP, so both of them are going to target the Staraptor. That reminds me, um, I should probably turn on HP from my, my side. Um, I can't predict what either one of these guys are going to do, so I'm going to protect one. Okay, if Brave Bird is one of them, right? Oh, Brave Bird is a Gastrodon. That's actually... That's, I think that's good. But I think Electivire would have been nicer because um, it was a range to kill the Evire. In any case, if it targets um, my Magnetone, it should always be 
It's always be Earth. And then if Electivire targets my mines, it should always be Cross Chops. I'm... Oh, no, not, not you. Holy crap, I almost messed up. Um... Let's, yeah, let's just go to Gyarados. Okay, Gastron should be dead anyway, though. Okay, yeah, cross trap me. Excellent. It still did so much damage, though. Okay, Bronzong in. That's totally fine. Which Bronzong is this? Is this the one with special moves? I think it's the one with special moves, because that should be Jupiter, though. Yeah, Psychic, Flash King, and Grass Knot. Okay, so if it does go for my Gyarados, I think it wants to Psychic. And then, if Evire goes for my Gyarados, it should always be Thunder Punch. Hmm. Just gonna go by score. Okay. Perfect. Oh, Para here would be so good. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. And it lives a Psychic because it's Sashed. Okay, I'm gonna protect one more time. Okay, and now, um, Brelin goes down. Yeah, Mega in, okay. Oh, wait, no, no, okay, wait, that's, uh, that's a little unfortunate. Because, like, if I had, like, something that, like, took- How much does Glyceport take from the end, Mega, actually? I'm not faster either, so I can't really stay in. I think- I think we go Magnazone. Just, it probably detects here, to be honest, but yeah. That, that's why I figured. Okay, well, Square Blitz... Very Arcanine Square Blitz is, um, the Enmega. Or, not the the Bronzong. Oh my god, Arcanine, you monster. Ugh. Pain Growth is... Not ideal. Okay, so if Yanmega goes for me, it should be Shadow Ball, right? It, it probably goes for Focus Blast on my Magnet Zone. But it, Arcanine, if you're the GOAT, you just, um... You can Fire Blitz kill this Yanmega. I think, I think I go Gyarados, though. Come on. Or Detect and, like, don't, and don't work again. Okay, Arcanine, eat it. Eat it up. Arcanine, you're a god. Oh my god. That's so good. Okay. Arcanine, thanks for helping us out. This Bronzong is very likely to set up rocks here, I think. But I feel like I have to... I, I kind of just have to attack, though, right? I'm just gonna attack. Okay, wait. Does close combat into crunch kill? If this- if we can prevent this thing from setting up rocks, then we're golden. I think it's a range to kill from there. Get the range, get the range, dude. Yes! Oh, okay! This thing can't set up rocks anymore. If it set up rocks, that would have been really, really bad. Yeah, per ugly in. I'm just gonna protect. The hair across is guts, but it's not faster than the per ugly. Okay. I think, should Metagross be a safe switch? It's gonna be either Metagross or Gliscor here, for sure. It should never focus box me, so... Probably can never kill, um, Empoleon. Okay, Para there is a little annoying, but... Not the worst. Okay, Ice Beam probably does not kill, right? I don't think it does. Ice Beam kills the... The Tangra, yep. Dude, Ampoli Barry's Empoleon is so good this battle. Water, Steel, excellent typing, and it has a great variety of coverage moves. Which just sync up really well with one another. I'm gonna go Gliscor. Because probably could Hypnosis. You know what? I think we just U-turn. Okay, well, Sucker. I'm for Sucker Punch. Okay. But Empoleon to sleep. That's a little annoying. Oh, clutch wake up, okay. Nice. Love to see it. Okay, that's even better actually. 
Okay, well, Skunk Tank should be down now. What the? What else is on um on Jupiter's team? Or did is that all of Jupiter's mons? I don't think so. Oh, I know it is. Okay, wait. Well, then we're chilling. Is that it? All right. Yeah. Cool. We did it. Honestly, that wasn't as brutal as I thought it would have been. Following this chaotic battle, Cyrus tries to use the power of Dialga and Palkia to create his perfect world, only to be stopped by the three Pixies and Giratina. And Cynthia and I follow him into the Distortion world. I go through the puzzle, which is the same as Vanilla, and Cyrus tries to make his dream a reality with one final battle. But there's a twist to this. He has a Dialga and a Palkia, both of which are 8 levels above the level cap. That doesn't sound very good. Luckily though, both of these legendary dragons have zero IVs across the board, making them easier to handle. The strategy is usually to find a way to take out the Dialga first, because of this really strange quirk with the AI. For reasons unknown to mankind, the Dialga's decisions are completely random, so in other words, even if it sees a kill on one of your Pokemon with a specific move, it has an equal chance of doing anything else. Therefore, you cannot manipulate the AI like what I did in the Snowpoint Temple battle. However, Palkia functions normally making it easier to strategize around. Anyway, what I did here was lead with Choice Scarf Togekiss and Focus Sash Inferno, and a combination of Moonblast and Close Combat would take out both of those dragons pretty handily. Taking out the Temporal and the Spatial Pokemon is still not enough though, and Cyrus is still not through, leading him to challenge me to a full battle. Here is his team, and the lead of Crobat is a big reason why I like to use Togekiss for the Dialga Palkia double battle. You see, Crobat here has a choice ban, and against Togekiss, it will always try to use Cross Poison. This means that pivoting a Steel type, in this case Steelix, completely invalidates it, because for some reason the AI won't switch out if it's locked into a move like this. Steelix can now set up a Stealth Rock and eventually take out the Crobat. This baits in Houndoom, which I bait using Garchomp. Next up is Cyrus's Ace Weavile, which can be taken out with Infernape Mach Punch. After this, Gyarados switches in. The way I handle this is by putting in Focus Sash Raichu, as it is dead to crit, but it still outspeeds and KOs the Gyarados. Honchkrow is the next Pokemon in. This is when things get really strange. Normally when the AI sees a kill with multiple moves, it will randomly select what move to use. However, if one of those moves is a priority move, then it chooses that over the other options. In this case, Cyrus's Honchkrow knows Sucker Punch. So that means I should be able to switch into anything, no problem. But, as you can see, that is not what happened at all. For some reason, Hodgecrow specifically does not function as normal, as this is not the first time I've seen it do something weird, even outside of this generation. Why Cyrus is obsessed with making his Hodgecrow use Brave Bird is something that people may never know. His last Pokemon is his Magnezone, which gets decimated by Garchomp, just like the Houndoom. And with that, Team Galactic's Reign of Terror officially comes to an end, and we can move on with our journey. Sunny Shore City presents the final gym challenge led by Electric-type Specialist Volkner. It's a good thing that this guy is just a gym leader though, because his team would not be allowed for Smogon singles or VGC. Come on Volkner, ever heard of Species Clause? Having two Rotom forms is illegal! I'm shaking my head in disappointment. Who allowed this guy to be a gym leader? Anyway, he leads with Jolteon holding a Focus Sash which is outsped by Choice Carp Garchomp. Jolteon has a 50-50 between Grass Knot and Shadow Ball now, and thanks to Garchomp's ability Rough Skin, the Sash can be rendered useless if it uses the former because Grass Knot makes contact. Unfortunately, not only did it use Shadow Ball instead, it also landed a crit. I take it out on the next turn after Volkner decides to spend his Hyper Potion on Jolteon. Luxray comes in next, because it knows Ice Fang. But due to the earlier crit, it has an equal chance to use Crunch on me, and I cannot stay in due to the Intimidate, leaving another 50-50. I switch to Mamoswine, and I lose this coin toss as well. But no worries, I had a Focus Sash just in case. Up next is Rotom Wash, so I first switch to Gyarados. Wait, Gyarados? Why would I bring a Pokemon with a 4 times weakness to Electric for a battle against an Electric-type specialist? Ironically enough, that's precisely why I'm bringing Gyarados for Volkner. I present to you the Pivot. A Pivot is a Pokemon that is primarily used for switching in and out, thanks to good defensive typing and stats, and it'll take minimal damage and allow for a safe switch right after. In this scenario, 
Gyarados' typing allows it to resist the various coverage moves that Wolfram's team can use against my ground types. However, against Gyarados, they will want to use their electric type moves to KO it. Ergo, a water flying type like Gyarados makes it an ideal pivot for a battle featuring a plethora of hyper offensive electric types. Continuing, I used Torterra to absorb the incoming Thunderbolt for the Rotom Wash and then take that out, while using my Bolt Absorb Lantern for the Rotom Heat. Finally, to finish off, I pivot to Gyarados to bait on another Thunderbolt and bring in my pre damaged Glycecore with a Salad Berry to outspeed and kill his Raichu and Electivire. I didn't actually need to do this as Garchomp would have done the job just fine, but I don't know, I guess I felt like being cheeky. Now all that remains between me and the Elite Four is Victory Road. In this game though, you are forced to explore through Route 224 before the Pokemon League, which leads us into a battle against Marley. Her team is full of speedy offensive Pokemon, so nothing too crazy here. Because her party is mostly a bunch of glass cannons, your win conditions are either to use Pokemon that are even faster than hers, or those that can take a hit and hit back hard. After this, we have one final battle with Dawn on Route 224, as well as one with Barry, and the final test awaits, the Pokemon League. What makes planning for the Elite Four in this game extra challenging is the fact that each member can use one of four different teams. This means I had to come up with 20 separate plans and find a team that can cover all 1024 team combinations. In the end, I came up with this, Bastiodon. A steel type with insanely good defensive stats means it has plenty of resistances it can pivot for. Torterra, a tank with shell armor allows for less risky play overall because I do not need to worry about critical hits in that case. Garchomp, a fast powerful ground type that can help take down Pokemon here and there and potentially sweep flint. Blissey, the wall that eats special moves for breakfast and provides a variety of utility. Glyscore, poison heal makes it difficult to take down and having a great overall typing with ground flying that synergizes perfectly with Bastiodon. And finally, Milotic. Water Fairy is another spectacular typing and has access to nice utility moves which Blissey may not have enough room for. Now that I have my team ready, as well as a 5 page google doc with all my plans completed, it was time for the grand finale. Shout out to you for making it this far, appreciate it a lot. I think I did a good job explaining my strategies for the Elite Four and Cynthia, so I hope that you enjoyed the live commentary. Alright. Okay. I think 3 is the least ideal of all of them, but... Whatever. This just means I can't stay in on Bastion. I have to go to... Wussy instead. Okay, go to the Pumpy. This is why Blissey's so insane. Just takes all these things like a champ. And this is Team 3. Is that a crit? Yeah, it's a crit. Seismic Toss. Just to chip it down a tiny bit makes it easier for Bastiodon. Let's go back to Bastiodon. Okay, don't freeze me. Don't do it. Good. Very good. Okay, Heracross should come in next, I think. Okay, yeah, it's Heracross. That's what I was thinking, but I wasn't too sure. Okay, this should always CC here. Go to, go to Glycecore. Yep, there it is. Perhaps a Toxic Orb. Oh, baby. That's kind of coins. Thanks for the sub, Tiff. Okay, Scizor in. I think this wants to go for Iron Head. I think. Actually, but then again, I am faster and I have Fire Thing. Let's just do that. Really? That doesn't- Ooh. Not the burn, so it doesn't matter. Why did I think that would kill? Okay, never punished. I, I must have calped that wrong. That's fine. Okay, beautify in. I think this is Hurricane. Alright. Do this first. Okay, Hurricane hit. It's like not ideal, but it's like kind of whatever. That's good. 
I think this goes for energy ball here, probably. Drop two. This drop on you. Yep. I think we just go straight for Terra for this. It should always be EQ. I guess it could knife slash in some scenarios, but that's like kind of whatever. And then Earthquake. Yeah, it just randomly knife slashes for some reason, even though it's not the highest damaging move. Which is a little annoying, but for in the case of like pivots and stuff. Like, not too bad overall in the grand scheme of things, I think. <sighs> okay. It should be Dust Toxic. Well, toxic. Oh, wait, no, I can't Toxic it. What am I doing? Why'd I. I'm an idiot. <laughs> it's okay. And well, he definitely heals here, right? There's no way he doesn't. Just to, like, slightly optimize everything. Make sure I can get a level up on Garchomp. Yeah, full restore easily. Go back to. Let's see. Oh my god. That crit did a lot of damage. Why? Alright, well, that's Aaron. I made two mistakes there. But we got out of it. And, uh, decent start so far. A quick two liner in this game. The pout on? Okay, excellent. That's the preferred option. Haunt? Don't let this thing use Stealth Rock. Because... Yep. Perfect. And I'll set up rocks of my own. Now we Aqua Tail disappears. Okay, now that we're about to see which ship how on this is. Okay, this is Team 1. This is Team 1. Because Team 2 if Alna has a Citrus Berry. Okay, taunt off. I'll taunt it again. Okay, no, it can't slack off. That's perfect. I think it's probably a range to kill here if I have to guess. Oh, up the crit there. Nice. That's actually pretty clutch. Okay, I think Whisk Cash comes in next. Yep. Portera handles this. Okay, finances, which doesn't really matter that much. We have protect and deal with the bounces. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, D dance again, this should be dead. Yeah, I think Glide Score comes in next. Get one reach seed off, please. Okay, protects there. No big deal. Okay, the, the, so now it has a toxic. Okay, wing attack did not really matter that much. It does do a decent chunk, but nothing like who has deep. But now, go to my own vice, I think. I think haunting here once is actually a good idea. But so that way I can ensure another Bruce. Yeah, wing attack should deal minimal damage to the life score. And plus with the leech seed, it should always be able to heal back the full. I think this should kill. And even if this doesn't like kill, I will yeah. I'll have to kill there. Okay, now right period is in. This is part on one, it should always ice punch here. If it doesn't ice punch here. It sees a kill with Ice Punch all the time. If it doesn't Ice Punch here, I'm gonna be pretty mad. We gotta pilot it. Nice. There we go. Easy. Ball. I don't think this kill is in Sand. That, I think that was a high one. I think she heals here, so... Well, that's annoying. I guess I have to stall to heal myself back. Okay, never mind, he doesn't heal. Now, Golem should follow up after this, uh... 
Hyperior. Oh, that's dead. And then Dawn Fan is in last. Nice. Nice hit. That's perfect. Alright. That's Flint down. Or not Flint, sorry. That's Bertha down, boys and girls. This is Team 4, okay. This is like, probably the second best option. Okay, Solar Beam. Kinda, whatever. Does AI in this game just love to spam Solar Beam? I feel like it does. Because when I played it for the first time, it just kept using Solar Beam. Okay, let's get a Stealth Rock. I need to get a seismic toss off in order to chip it down. The reason why I switched out of my guard chomp is because this is not a guaranteed kill. Um without the without the chip. Okay, I'm gonna safeguard once. In case like for whatever reason it does decide to fire blast or something. Although at the rate we're going it probably won't. Okay, look now we go back to guard chomp. Earthquake. Alright. Oracle down. My Flojin is in. This thing is Choice Guard. My Guard Chomp is also Choice Guard. And this kills. My Guard Chomp is insanely cracked. It's a hasty 28 speed Guard Chomp. Getting the hasty EB from Quinley Town from your mom, that one really paid off. It helped me get this, and it also helped me get a hasty Lucario, which was quite helpful for this run. Okay, Houndoom comes in, it intimidates me, but even through the intimidate, my earthquake still kills this. Right there did not matter. And the earthquake still kills here, even through the intimidate, because of Stealth Rock. If it was if Stealth Rock weren't there, then I would not be able to then this earthquake would not work. But because it is there, it does work. I go to Pussy again. On top of that, this this also allows um this also allows me to not have to risk um burn if on the flamethrower. I should have go for it. Okay, flamethrower is being there. Exactly what we were preparing for. So I iron head there instead of rock tomb, and you'll see why in a bit. Gotta go to Milo. And then I kill with Ice Beam. But this the reason why I went for the Iron Head there is so that Milo can switch in and kill with the Ice Beam. Arcanine comes in, that's the last Pokemon in. AI should always go for Wild Charge here. I wanted my Lodic in, so that it would Wild Charge me. And that makes Garchomp a safe switch, because it's ground type, which makes it immune to electric, and I pick up the Earthquake kill. There we go, that's Flint, guys! Okay, don't, please don't be Team 1. Please don't be Team 1. Okay, this is not Team 1. Perfect. That's that's good. That's really good. Okay, this is Team 3, I think? Yeah, it's Team 3. So, how did I, how did I want to lead with this again? T-Wave, right? Let's toss it down. Okay, Hypnosis is a little annoying, but it's like not that big because of people, to be honest. That's just not very convenient. We just need a Hypnosis Miss at least once. Well, no full carrot there, that's like... Okay, okay misses Hypnosis there. Perfect. I 
just barely. That's okay. Just gonna stay in and try to get another T Way box. Okay, and reflect is off. That's great. That's awesome. Close this thing. Now Galate is in. Okay, so now I can go to Glyscore and take the close combat that should be coming in. I guess it could technically be like other things. This team doesn't have a Metagross, so I can go ahead and kill this straight up. Okay, fly. Oh wait, I'm faster? I thought this thing was Jolly. Oh, maybe Speed Tie? But even then, like, shouldn't... Huh. That's super weird. But okay. I mean, we'll take it. Not like it would have made a huge... Necessarily. Alright, Jinx is in. Go to Blissey. And I, I dodged the poison. Okay, I'm gonna de wave it once. It does have synchronized, but I have natural cure, which means that I just need to switch out. And I think what I can do is Forest Spear again or Full Para. Either of which should be fine. Yeah. And this wants to table me, then I pivot to Torterra. I kill it, yep. And then Slowbro comes in. Okay, just hit the Leech Seed here. Excellent. This goes for Flamethrower, but I'm never dead because I can't get crit. If I could get crit, then I would be dead to crit here, but I can't get crit, so all is well. Well, no, only some rolls of crit kill me, I think. Like, it's gonna die eventually. I'll just go to Milo, it's probably the better play anyway. Okay, Milo did bubbles up. That's a nice one. Earthquake click me. Or that. <laughs> I'll take the Hypnosis, too. Oh wow, that crit, okay. We will take it. Alright, there we go, that's Lucian! All that remains. Just one trainer left. That's Cynthia. Cynthia time. Let's do this. As a Pokemon League Champion, I accept your challenge. Okay, come on. C come on. Okay, this is team one. Perfect. That's probably best case scenario, to be honest. Just safeguard once. So now it has a dark pulse. Or, or it's five turns, actually. So that's one turn, this is two turns. Moon Blast? This is a two shot. What's that crate here? Maybe I should have switched to Blissey. Okay. Oh yeah, I got the one berry. Let me switch back to Blissey. Because I think safeguard's gonna end soon. Get up another safeguard. There we go. This is the OG Platinum team. Okay, Rose right in. It always leaves on me. The goal here is to get a T Wave off. Okay, no crit there is excellent. Okay. Okay, perfect. I'm still never dead to crit. Perfect. That's also like kind of whatever as well. Ooh, a crit, okay. I mean I guess that's fine. Okay, so now you're in. And um Lucario comes in. Can protect once. I jump kick. Close itself. 
Alright. This is the one point of failure here. If I get crit by this high jump kick, even though I never die, I could be in a really bad spot for the rest of the fight. Alright, come on, Vice Score. You just gotta hold. Let's, go, let's get the Prages out, guys. Hold, Vice Score. Vice Score holds. Great. Alright. My Lodic in. Blissey's back in. Oh. I'm just gonna go Bastion on half it. Okay, this should always Earthquake me, so we go to Port. Can't get Crypt too because of Shell Armor. Alright guys, here's a 1% chance to lose a run. We hit the Leech Seed, we win. Or at least we don't lose. Perfect. Alright, so now, it should always Outrage here. Go to my Lotus. And then it always EQ's here. Go to Glyceful. Let's see you turn out. I take a bit of damage from Rock Skin, but that's okay. Could be another Outrage. Yep. Yeah, I'm going for it. We're full sending this stuff, boys! Garchomp down, let's go! All that remains is the Togekiss. Let's go back to Blissey. We taunt it. So we can't do like dumb status stuff to us or any of that bullcrap. So time to fair flinch this thing, boys. Iron Head. How does it feel for me to play your own card against you, huh, Togekiss? Okay, it's a crit. Crit to Paraflinch would be so beautiful. Oh, it actually flinched, it's too easy! That's Renegade Platinum, Hardcore Plus Nuzlocke, Deathless completed! <laughs> Let's go! And yeah, there it is. That is the story of how I beat the hardest generation for Nuzlocke without a single death. If you're new to hardcore Nuzlocke and want to try playing a ROM hack, I would absolutely recommend this for your first game. Thank you so much for coming along on this adventure with me. If you made it this far, appreciate you a ton. You're awesome and you know it. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like, hit the subscribe button, and turn on notifications. Comment down below if you have any ideas on what I should do for my next challenge. And with that, I'm out. See you guys next time.